Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see those of you that are still here and, and newcomers. Um, so I'm going to be taking up the majority of your time here today, and then um, Kelly will be following up with some additional information and resources. We have a lot to cover. This is basically like a one-week apprenticeship that is squeezed down into about an hour, so or an hour and a half. So um, yeah, please bear with us. Uh, and also, um, I am happy to send my PowerPoint out to anybody. There's a lot of information on these PowerPoint slides, so don't worry about you know having to take notes or read through the entire slide or anything. Um, so this is uh, this one of our adorable foster dogs. So here's my contact information. Um, I also have some cards at the back, um, but you know again, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, so the little guy over on the right, uh, that was Mick Jager. He was um, one of a litter of 10 three and a half week old puppies that were brought to me about you know six months into my fostering experience. Um, I, I begged other fosters to take some of them uh, before they, they drove me crazy. The guy on the left, that's Max. Max was my very first foster uh, dog. And I, um, as I'm, uh, for those of you that heard me before, I started volunteering with APA really kind of right at the beginning, um, you know, about a month after we'd pulled our first dog. I went to volunteer orientation, and at that time, people were doing multiple things, so our volunteer coordinator was also the person that was going down to the city shelter, reviewing the youth list, and um, trying to find, uh, trying to get uh, fosters for them. Uh, she could not find a foster for Max, and his time was up. And she, so she reached out to me, and she made it pretty clear what was going to happen to Max if I did not come forward. I was terrified of this. You know, I kind of thought that I would ease into this. I'd have a few months to kind of, you know, get used. Yeah, really, I know. Right. To say I was naive is just, you know, I mean, yeah. But, um, but here I was. I was faced. I mean, I was looking at this picture. I mean, what could I do? So I took Max in. Um, as uh, one of our adoption counselors said, Max was a handful. Um, and uh, I had him for about three months. It took us, it took us a while to find his adopter. Um, and during that time, it was, it was a great learning experience. I, one, I learned just from you know, fostering Max, but I also like, volunteered in a lot of different areas within APA, was able to learn you know, a, a, you know, everything like from what the adoption counselors did to the, you know, we participated in the volunteer orientation and everything, so it was a great learning experience. Well, the other very naive thing that I did um, when I started, I didn't realize that um, Austin Pets Alive, that we were in our infancy of rescue work. I knew that they had been a nonprofit that was around for a while, um, and I was trying to find inf out information, and so I asked if I could start attending the team meetings. Um, so you know what happened. You know, three months later, Ellen said, when is Anne going to take over the dog foster program? Uh, but um, uh, anyway, as I said, it was, it was just a really great uh, learning experience. Um, the other thing that I want to point out about that is that I mentioned that APA, you know, had been in existence for a long time. Austin Pets Alive was first formed before the millennium with the goal of making Austin no kill by the year 2000. Obviously, that didn't happen. So I think the very first lesson was, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Um, it took eight years for them to kind of reform, and but, you know, look at us now. Um, and forgive me for looking at notes. If I get off down a rabbit trail, we'll be here all afternoon. So, um, so the second lesson is what I just kind of talked about, that it's really, sometimes it's really important to just go ahead and make the ask. If that um, rescue person had not reached out to me and said, will you take this dog, um, I, I might not have. And so, uh, and there's a fine line that we walk between pressuring and, you know, just saying, hey, can you step up to the plate on this one? Um, Let's see. So, and then the, the third lesson, which is something I've already kind of alluded to, when I started attending the team meetings, uh, that was when it hit me. It was like, oh my gosh, we're still figuring some of this out. You know, this is, I didn't just step into an organization that's got their act fully together. And so the, the, the third lesson was that don't wait until everything is perfect to start. You need to, you need to get the basics, something that Kelly had talked about earlier, and we'll talk about more here, but just, just go ahead and do it. Just start. And I, I think every day that you wait to make it perfect, a dog, another dog is dying in the shelter. 
And I also, I want to point out, I, we do, I do use the terminology shelter because that's our perspective. APA pulls from this. But I think that the same thing applies to any rescue group. It doesn't matter if you're pulling off of um, notices that you see out there, if you're working with a breed-specific rescue, um, kind of the analogy is the same because, you know, you, th there are more dogs out there. They may not be in a shelter, but it's, you know, it, it's going to be a long time before we run out of dogs that, that, that need saving. Um, and then I think that the other thing that was very important about this time that I learned is that it is really important to empower people and to do the job. That was something that, that Dr. Jefferson did with me. And I, you know, I, I joke, and I like to say that I thought that she just, you know, saw this amazing talent that I had and what I brought to this. But the honest truth is that I was a warm body that had time that was willing to take this on, you know. So, um, yeah, don't, don't overlook the people, the people around you. So just a, kind of a brief history of the dog foster program. So this, you know, as I said, started out with, with uh, just me. Um, it was uh, several months before we had any kind of facility. So initially, we were a completely foster-based program. Then we did get, um, it was just a bare bones space where animals were literally, dogs were created, it was healthy adult dogs that were created overnight. We had a team, um, we'd, we did pay for um, cleaners, dog workers, that would come in the morning, clean up, get them out for walks. Then the adoption counselors would take them out. They'd be at site all day and they'd go back and spend the night. That really allowed us to, to start saving animals beyond just the foster program. So it gave us a little bit of, a, um, a little bit of relief. Um, January of 2009, I recruited my first volunteer. Then, you know, as you see, I continued to add volunteers, add teams. Um, in about two years, in 2010, we moved into our first shelter space. This was completely renovated by volunteers. Um, it was volunteers down there um, nailing two by fours together, painting, and not only were we there doing the work, we were going to Home Depot with our credit card saying, okay, charge the two by fours to this, to this card, charge the paint here. Um, so it was really um, it's a, a kind of volunteer um, APA initiative. Um, the team grew, you mentioned Austin achieved no kill. Um, in 2012, we moved into the Town Lake Animal Center. Um, I hope that you get to do a tour of that. Um, it's, uh, it, it's interesting to see people's first experience there. This used to be the Austin Animal Center, and I believe this facility um, was the oldest um, animal shelter in the state. At least it was around then. I think it was built like in the 1950s. Um, and there are reasons why the Austin Animal Center was moving out of there, but we were thrilled to have this space. Again, it just gave us more capacity. Um, and in um, 2014, the dog foster manager became a full-time position. We initially, um, it was allocated between two part-time positions. Um, and then we've uh, been fortunate and been able to add some staff uh, in 2016 and 2017. Um, just by the numbers, um, I think that uh, uh, what's really, last year we averaged about 538 dogs in foster during the month. I think earlier this morning, Ellen said, you know, we about doubled. We usually more than double our capacity. For dogs, our um, shelter capacity between the Town Lake and Terrytown um, facilities is about 200. So we generally, real, you know, far exceed that doubling it talked about the staff already, talked about the team volunteers, and then the five main teams that we, that really were kind of initially developed and then uh, we still have today. Um, in 2017, APA saved over 10,000 lives. Now this is dogs and cats combined, and that included 5,000 that were made homeless by Hurricane Harvey. Um, those numbers would not have been possible without a foster program. Uh, in 2017, um, there were, we had 671 dog foster homes, but, and the number that I don't have up here, is that there were over a thousand dogs in foster during the month of, of uh, September. Now you can imagine going from a program that generally has three or four hundred dogs at one time in foster to, to more than doubling that, and what that took for the team to be able to step up and manage that, you know, th those numbers. Um, something else that we started tracking a little bit over a year ago were the adoption fees that we took in for um, our foster dogs. Now this is a gross amount. It doesn't take into consideration the costs of your staff and all of that. 
But I think that this was really important because um, as Dr. Jefferson said earlier, your, your foster program is one of the cheapest things that you can do. Like I said, initially ours was completely volunteer. Well, at the same time, it, it's a revenue source. And so those, those are all adoption dollars that are being brought in you know, through a foster program. And of course, ultimately what that just means is more life saving. So why dog foster program? Um, and I've kind of touched on really on most of these already. Um, it increases your capacity. Um, it allows you to begin saving lives without a shelter. Um, saves populations that are difficult to manage in a shelter environment. Uh, you know, this is like your puppies, your bottle babies, your, your little scaredy dogs, um, dogs with medical issues. And something that's really becoming even more critical these days as we're getting to that last kind of the big, big dog percentage is providing a break for, for dogs that are declining in a shelter. And then I think the sec this third area is, is really important, enabling an organization to meet emergency needs. Uh, I already gave the example of Hurricane Harvey, which, just, which was huge. Um, but we also, so facility failures has been a big thing with us. Because we're dealing with an old facility that it was basically in a floodplain, flooding was a constant issue. And there are a number of times where we had torrential rains come through. We had to put a plea out to the community um, that we needed fosters to come down and get these animals because their, their kennels were, were uh, flooding. And there are pictures of people lined up down the block to, to take um, animals out of the shelter to, to do that. It's, yeah. Uh, gets to be every time. So facility failures, same thing here. Obviously, Austin's hot in the summer. You know, your air conditioning goes out. You've got to, you know, get people to get them out of there. And then um, other emergency situations. Uh, several years ago, we had huge um, forest fires in a community east of us. And um, again, we the foster program really stepped up. We had over 500 people apply to foster excuse me, apply to foster in just a couple of weeks, and we approved over 200 people in that time. Now, not all of those people stayed on to foster, but some of them did. And again, during that time, uh, we were able to uh, help save a lot of dogs. And one of the things that we did then, I think, which was a lesson, kind of came out of Hurricane Katrina, and how rescue organizations need to respond to these emergencies differently is that instead of bringing in animals that were found in those communities, we took the animals from those local shelters so that they had room to bring in those animals. That kept the animals in the community, so it was e easier for people to find, uh, find their, their pets. Um, potential foster populations, I think you all know these. Um, uh, initially, so as I've mentioned, when we first started out, Every dog went to foster. It was the only way we could save one. Um, once we got that small um, space, then we limited it to the bottle babies, young puppies, pregnant or nursing mothers, dogs with medical needs, seniors, only if they really needed extra care. If they were a healthy senior, they, they were able to, to stay in the shelter. Um, Shire fearful, fearful animals and unvaccinated dogs. And we were pretty clear about that. Those were the only animals that went to foster because we really, you know, again, it was all about kind of increasing our capacity. Now, we, um, all of these uh, types of animals are eligible for foster care. Um, so getting started, uh, again, for those of you that were here last time, Kelly kind of touched on this. Uh, there are some things you don't want to just, we, we urge you to just get started, but there are some things you've got to have in place. Um, you do have to have a few foster parents. Like I said, I had a list of maybe 20. I would say 10 of them were truly foster parents. The other 10 were kind of, well, call me if you need somebody to take a dog like for one night, you know. Um, you need to have a method to track dogs and fosters. This is really critical. We used Pet Point, but I also, for one thing, because I'm not such a technological whiz and I struggled with Pet Point, and it wasn't particularly user friendly for the foster program, I also kind of had maintained my own list. And to this day, we've since switched to Shelter Love, but we maintain our own spreadsheet for the foster program. And it's just, um, it's proven to be very helpful because you absolutely have to know where all of your foster animals are at any uh, time. Um, you've got to have a, a plan for onboarding, um, an application, an agreement. You've got to have some sort of contract with your fosters and how are you going to get them into the system. Your intake, how, where are your animals going to come from? Like I said, for us initially, it was all from the Austin Animal Center. Once we achieve no kill, we've expanded that. We now pull from other communities around us, but you've got to have a system for how to do that, where your foster is going to get them. 
you have to have some guidelines for fosters. And um, initially, what we had was mostly just kind of animal care. We developed policies and procedures kind of as we went along, and it was probably like the third or fourth year before I actually put together a handbook um, with that information. Um, you have to have a means to provide medical care. We initially um, contracted out all of our spay neuters with a, a local um, low cost spay neuter program, but you've got to have some way to, to get that for your animals. And then of course you've got to have a, a way to get them out. You've got to have a process for adoptions. So some of the challenges and considerations. Um, first of course is funding. Uh, so if you are going to contract out for medical care, how many animals does that translate to? If you're going to use your staff, well, how much staff time? What is how many animals does that does that turn into? I think the other thing with funding is, um, uh, in looking at medical, uh, you really need to consider uh, some of the things that can happen. One, for one thing, you really want to think be strategic. If you've got if you're considering pulling in an animal that has a lot of very high medical needs, while your gut may be saying that you want to save that that animal. If that is potentially going to bring your organization down with the cost, you you know you may need to make the difficult decision to pass them up and go to others because that's going to allow you to continue to save to save others. Now, um, uh, let's see, and uh, uh, just another thing along those lines: just be prepared for the unexpected. Early in our kind of in, to, in 2009, so kind of moving into our next calendar year. Uh, the city was not vaccinating all of their dogs on intake, and all of a sudden we were hit with a huge distemper outbreak. And um, those animals had to go into foster, both because in most cases they were symptomatic and they needed that care, uh, but also because you wanted to get them out of the shelter to try to isolate it. Um, I, I don't know any of you that have ever fostered a distemper, uh, do a dog with distemper, it can be one of the most heartbreaking things. So on top of trying to make those placements, you're dealing with the emotion of these fosters that are having their dogs die despite their best efforts. And even if they're not dying, they're dealing with, with the tremors, with everything else that comes with it. So, um, and that was something that just about you know, brought APA under. Fortunately, again, marketing cannot stress it enough. Um, we got the word out to the community and the community supported us and, and so we were able to uh, get through that. People, what are your staff and our volunteer limitations? Now let me tell you, under Dr. Jefferson, you're always pushing this to the max. Um, but you still just have to recognize that there is a limit to what you can ask um, of, of people. Um, facilities, again, do you have a facility or are you completely foster based? That's going to um, determine a lot of it. And then fosters, do you have enough, including your specialized foster homes, to care for the dogs you're bringing in? Now, a caveat about that. That doesn't mean that, okay, I've got to wait until I've got 30 fosters lined up before I, I plan to pull 30 dogs. It just means you've got to have some, you've got to have a plan to play in place to bring more in and, and not overstress your situation. Low-hanging fruit, I think everybody's heard, heard of this. Um, this morning they talked about it being kind of the spectrum that you know, it's like from the very easy to the, to the other. So it's just knowing where you are on that spectrum and what group that you're gonna go after. Um, and again, just what, what I was talking about earlier, if you're just getting started, um, you really may need to focus on where can I have the most life-saving impact with the least resources um, it, until I get to the point where I can take on more. Um, so the growth of the dog foster team. So again, uh, just to repeat, you know, in July 2008, team of one, 20 fosters, then you know, now in 2017. Now, the reason that I chose these two pictures is this was another one of my fosters. You can do this when you're doing a presentation. You could just feature all your own dogs. Um, uh, so this is Trapper. And um, Trapper was actually born in 2008, but I fostered him in, I think it was the end of 2011. Anyway. Um, and one thing that struck me when I was putting this together is um, Trapper was born the year that APA started. If APA had not been in place, didn't have the safety net to save him when he needed us two years later, he would have been killed. And um, I, I don't know, I, I never did know his history, how he wound up at the shelter. He was a great little dog. I think he's adorable. And my guess is that, you know, he could have been one of those puppies that was adopted. And, you know, then he turned into an adolescent and a teenager. And all of a sudden, he wasn't as cute and it wasn't as convenient. Um, or maybe his family moved. I don't know. But anyway, he wound up in the shelter. So I got him. Um, interestingly enough, too, I thought there was nothing wrong with him. And I brought him in to the clinic to pass him off to a new foster because I always tried to do that as fast as possible. And I happened to see Dr. Jefferson. And she looked down and she said, 
oh, you know, he's got ringworm. And I said, oh, no, I didn't know that. Um, so I guess he's staying with me because that family had kids. Um, but at any rate, he was one that I was um, considering, you know, you want to adopt them all. But he was one I was, you know, seriously considering about, and, but a great family came along. And uh, so I let him go. And uh, I don't know, about 18 months ago, I reached out to them because I tried to not stalk them throughout the course. And um, his adoptive mom was very sweet, and she sent me this current picture of him. This is, you know, and, and he's gone on to live the life that I had hoped he would have. So, um, and I'm hoping that there'll be time that I can share a little bit more about Trapper. Um, so this is the current organizational chart for the dog foster program. Um, I mentioned at one time we had two co-managers, then we went to, and that's, that's really difficult in management. You know, no matter how well you work together, that can be kind of a difficult scenario. I'm not saying don't ever do it, but I think it does generally work better when you've got a person that's kind of in charge, and then um, we have an assistant manager. So the, um, the kind of orange colored ones are the teams. Um, the, the white are the staff positions, and then the gray are the, the, um, you know, the various volunteers that um, support all of that. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I think we all know dog foster manager, the main thing is they oversee all of it. And as I alluded to earlier, the advantage of having these teams is that it does free a manager up to look at the big picture, to do that oversight, to keep an eye on the data and the numbers. Um, the onboarding team, uh, and this is the link to our application. Um, the easiest way, if you want to take a look at that, is go to our website, go through to our foster section, just click on the application, um, that, and you can kind of go through that. Um, unless you're in Austin, please don't go ahead and submit it. You know, um, apply to foster where you live, but you can at least you can see that. So this is the team that brings on, um, uh, you know, our, our new fosters. Um, just a few things that I want to mention at this phase ab about this. So I talked um, earlier about simplifying kind of the screening or the onboarding uh, uh, policy, and I'm going I'm to get to that a little bit more. But I also want to talk about the application and the agreement. When I started, we were using a paper application. Um, people would fill out the application, they would fax it to us, it would be, the fax would be emailed to me, I'd have to print out the application, and it was the same thing with the contract. And we had to do the contract on every single dog. Didn't matter if the person had fostered before, they have a new foster dog, they've got to do this. And even more so, if they had a litter of puppies, we were supposed to have one filled out for every single member of the, every you know, puppy in the litter. I quickly put an end to that. I said, oh no, we're doing one agreement for this whole litter. We'll do one for mom, one for this whole litter. Um, but it was, needless to say, it was, that was really difficult. And with, with, our, um, with the agreements, so the idea was that I would line up this foster, then I would have to go get the contract from them before they could go pick up the dog. Well, Austin's a big community. For me to go you know, meet up with some, so the other thing that I did pretty soon into it, and I did this on my own. This is what I'm talking about, being empowered to do this. I would email it out to the foster and I say, you know, send it back to me, say you've read and agreed to these terms, and then sign it and put it in the mail to me. Um, so what happened is we rocked along with that system and then um, at one point, I actually had a situation where we had to come back and refer to this. A foster dog had gotten out, bitten the neighbor, the neighbor was threatening to sue, we were having to come back to find this. Well, I tend to be extremely anal about keeping things and filing and all of that stuff. I could find the agreement that this foster had signed for their previous foster dogs. I could find the one that they did after. I could find the agreement that I had sent to them. I could not find the agreement that came back to us. It turned out okay because we were able to show enough you know, good faith that the foster was aware of, of the situation. But what it said to me is that even with somebody who was so careful about maintaining all of those, I had, my computer was full of all of these files, it wasn't 100%. So when we went to um, getting our application on the web, I lobbied very hard to have the agreement incorporated into the application, and I strongly encourage that. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's worked for us. Um, we've been doing this, we, we were able to implement this, um, I think about eight months after we started, and um, we have not had an issue with it. So I strongly encourage that. I strongly encourage you to get it web-based. It makes such a difference when that person is you know, trolling the internet at midnight and wants to apply to just go boom and, and submit the application. 
Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the screening process that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, I, I, for those of you that were in here earlier, I talked about one of my greatest fears was how do I know if this person is a good foster? And my quick realization that, you know what, dogs are dying over here. I'd rather take a chance with this person. So basically, it really came down to gathering some basic information, you know, how many animals they had, how many kids, um, were their animals vaccinated, and then mostly kind of an informational sharing point um, in the interview. Um, I, um, we've never done home visits prior to. Um, and we, we did initially require reference checks. I stopped doing that because not too many people are stupid enough to give you three reference checks that are not gonna you know, pan out. Um, there was one family that had trouble coming up with three and I should have watched, listened to that red flag. But, um, but really, basically, they, they never really um, yielded any valid information. And what they did do was slow the process down. Because you never got those people the first time around. Maybe they were just screening calls. But you had to wait for a call back. The same thing was true with vet checks. So we eliminated that. Um, we also were very inclusive. We, we don't put any additional restrictions. Like you can only foster if, um, if you have a fenced yard or any of that. We look at those things when we're matching them with a foster, but in terms of bringing you in, we're, we're gonna be very inclusive. Um, we tried to be very prompt, um, initiating the contact within 24 hours, and then we also tried to follow up and get a dog to them as soon as possible. People, you know, their interest wanes. They can be on to something else if you are not right on it. And so we really wanna move quickly. And then the one at the top, do a Google search. This is not something that we were doing initially, um, but at some point we really felt that this was important. Again, not because we necessarily get anything out of it. What we're really doing is just to ensure that there's nothing out there. We don't want to have an animal with a foster have something happen and then have somebody come and say, well, did you see, I mean, all you have to do is Google their name and they were busted for um, dog fighting uh, in Louisiana, you know? So, um, so we do that and um, now um, we've gone to, I mentioned post Harvey to an even more simplified. This was just a phone interview. Now we just do a review of the application. And um, obviously if there are red flags, <coughs> excuse me, if there's any information missing, we'll follow up on them. One of the things that made this possible that we were not always able to do before is that we have, um, we have staff on site and volunteers. And so whenever a foster is picking up a dog from our Town Lake Animal Center, they are meeting with a live person. So there is an opportunity to meet with that person. You know, you can kind of identify, oh, oh my gosh, does this person seem clueless and they're taking home this behavior dog? Um, and also those people know when it's a new foster. Um, obviously the really tenured fosters, like Chris Guthrie would say, here, take them, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, and then I think the other thing, especially back in the day when we were starting, we were doing these phone things was, we really made it a mon our mantra on the foster program to be enthusiastic, welcoming, flexible, and appreciative. You know, again, it wasn't just the foster program. We were representing APA, and we were trying to get APA off the ground, and so those were all really important things. The placement team, I talked about that a little bit before, um, that in the other one, that this is the team that posts please. We use a Google group. All new fosters sign up to that Google group. When we have a dog that, or, or puppies or what litter, um, we post to this group. They then contact us. The placement then team um, does a little you know, back and forth with the foster to just make sure that this is an appropriate match. And if it is, they, um, they let, tell them what, you know, where and when they can get the dog. And also if there are any special considerations, like if it's a, um, a scared dog, we have a scared dog protocol, so we make sure that they, they know things like you know, to transport them in a crate, um, always have like two barriers so that the dog can't you know, dart out the house, et cetera, things like that. So our placement process, again, initially, it was a matter of people going through the euthanasia list at APA, contacting me, saying we need fosters for this. Um, now that we've expanded, um, our requests come in through a lot of different ways. It can come from our shelter, and that can either be, you know, shelter staff have, have identified that, that this dog is kind of starting to decline and needs to get out to foster. It can be from our behavior team that says, you know, we really need to see if we can get a foster that can work with this um, behavior person, or with this behavior dog a little bit. 
Um, of course, we continue to take dogs from the Austin Animal Center. Um, we especially focus on their medical and behavior cases because they're doing such a fabulous job of, of uh, getting their other animals um, placed into foster and uh, uh, adoptive homes. And then also um, through our positive alternatives to shelter surrender. So what this program does is try to keep animals from going into the shelter. Um, so sometimes, you know, people will reach out to them and uh, say, you know, um, I, you know, I need help rehoming my dog. This has happened. I've got to find. And we used to never be able to take those into foster. Now, if that person is willing to foster their dog while we look for a home, we will we'll work with them. We'll make them a foster for that time so their animal can get posted to the website. Um, if they haven't been spayed and neutered and all of that, we do that. Um, we are the ones in charge of the adoption. We get the adoption fee, and um, so that works really well. And in some cases, if it's a really desirable dog, you know, if it's like a little, you know, two-year-old Shih Tzu, um, that we know we can get adopted in a nanosecond, we'll even just take them in even if they're not willing to foster. Um, so this team writes and posts the pleas. They are the ones that met, make the match. They provide written information, center foster, and, um, and then as I mentioned, they meet with um, staff or a volunteer when they pick up. So I've kind of touched on some of these things, you know, in, in ensuring it's a good match. I mean, this is pretty brief, but it's pretty much, you know, kind of like if it's a dog that it might take a while, okay, are you going to be able to keep this dog for this time? Um, and, you know, if it's a dog that, this is where it comes in that if this is a dog that needs to go home, go to a home with no dogs or no kids, that we um, confirm that. Um, yeah, and then also medical needs, um, because they're picking up from our shelter, then we also um, make sure that there's somebody there that can show them if the dog needs insulin injections or eye, you know, eye drops or something to show them how to do that. So mentor support. Um, we have, so our mentoring team, this is basically the team that the foster works with throughout most of the time that they're fostering. Um, we have a medical liaison now that works um, is kind of you know between the mentor team and the the clinic um, to help facilitate all of all of that. Um, uh, but basically, the mentor team is primarily responsible for ensuring that all of the medical is taken care of. So they work with the foster and make sure that the vaccines are, um, are, are done timely. They schedule the spay neuter, and they're also kind of the first triage point if there are any medical issues. Um, the foster can tell, you know, communicate with them, and you know they can say. Okay, I think this sounds good. Just kind of monitor the, the puppy, but if it comes to this, and let us know. And if this happens, it's urgent. You need to do this. So they really, um, and, and they're frequently able to respond faster than our clinic does. So that's, that's been a real, um, a real help. Then our outreach coordinator, this is the person I mentioned earlier um, about, you know, they're also following up with some of the new fosters. And, and this is, can be phone, email, um, just to see, you know, uh, you know, how are they doing? We also have somebody who is um, reaching out to new fosters, sending them a list of animals that, that need foster, that might, you know, meet. so we're, we're trying to be proactive in, in reaching out to some of those people. Then we also have specialized mentors. Um, we have mentors for bottle babies and also for pregnant and nursing mothers. Um, we have a great behavior team, so that's, that's kind of handled a little bit differently. So our adoption team, this is the team that um, they reach out to the foster when it's about time for the dog to be adopted. So if the foster has puppies, this is usually like just before the seventh week, um, we make our puppies available for adoption at seven weeks, but they're not spayed or neutered or in the, um, until eight weeks. Um, let's see, and they basically coordinate all of this. We do have some offsite adoptions and, or, uh, adoption offsites. And so this team will schedule, if we have a dog, a foster dog that can go out to one of these adoption sites, they'll schedule that. Um, they also follow through once the foster has, um, there's, you know, they've had a good meet and greet, they've got a good match, they kind of turn this over to the, to the team. The team makes all the arrangements with the adopter, sets up the adoption, which is done by one of our adoption counselors, and then all of the adopter has to do is go meet with the foster, show them the signed adoption contract, and they can take the, the foster dog home. Um, we, are, we maintain a little bit more control of both the medical and the adoption process than I think some groups do. I mean, I think it's whatever you know, works best for you. 
With us, because of the volume we've done, we do, we found that this really works for us because it allows us, as I said, to really keep the animals moving through the system. Um, I think with the adoption, there are pros and cons. Obviously, this is another barrier, having to have the adopt, you know, where the foster can't just do the adoption in their home. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of our fosters appreciate the fact that there is this additional kind of, you know, there's this person who's also going to be talking to them that, you know, might see a red flag that they didn't. And that, then our adoption counselors also handle all the paperwork. They handle the money. Um, they go over all of the um, information about, you know, vaccinations, preventatives. Um, and also, if it's an animal with behavior um, issues, uh, they'll have a behavior consult with somebody from our behavior team. If it's an animal with um, severe medical issues, they'll have a medical consult with our medical team. So we also have a dog foster adoption advocate and an assistant. And this, um, we actually got this position as a part-time position through a grant that we applied for. And this person is kind of really proactively looking at the animals that we have that we're trying to get adopted and um, things like making sure that what's their website profile? Do we need to make it, you know, do they need a video? Do we need to make any changes there? Can we get them out to events? Can we get them out to adoption sites? And just kind of be that little extra support. Um, the foster events team. This team um, works with our APA development team. As APA grew, people were coming out of the woodwork wanting to do special events and feature us. And it's a wonderful thing, but it's also overwhelming. And there's no way that our marketing team could work with every single group that wanted to do that. So what they've done is that if it's a, a situation where they feel it might be a good um, foster exposure event, They'll refer it to us, we'll evaluate it, and if it seems like it might be a good opportunity for fosters to showcase their dogs, then we'll work directly with that organization. We have some volunteer, um, some, some volunteer adoption counselors that can sometimes be there to do the adoption on site uh, or at the event, but if they're not, we just treat it as a meet and greet and then we'll schedule the adoption um, later. So this has, been, um, this has been a big help. And the other thing that the team is, is, tries to do is to develop more of those um, on their own. And that's been a struggle, as you know. I mean, it's, there's what you want to do and what you get around to doing. But um, uh, records coordinator, this was, this was just um, another one of our positions. When we went to Shelter Love, the beauty of Shelter Love is that information is entered or should be entered right away. Um, but what that does is it kind of put it on us to enter all of the animals that were coming into the system. So we were also able to get a part-time paid position to do this, which really helped kind of facilitate things. She gets them in the system, and then each of the team members from that point on takes over making sure that the database is updated with, um, with all of the, uh, their information. We're very, very fortunate at APA now to have a lot of other support um, besides what I've talked about up until now is all the support that they receive just on the dog foster um, team. This is the other support that's available through the team. So we have a whole we have a whole dog marketing group. You know, they're the ones that they have volunteers that will write a bio if you know based on the information the foster sends. Um, they will, you know, crop photos, try to improve photos. They even have volunteers that will go out and, and take photos of dogs that need it. They'll do, um, uh, uh, they have volunteers that do videos. Um, so that's a real support. Um, our adopt line handles all the inquiries from the web. So if somebody sees a dog on the web or a cat, they reach out to the adopt line. The adopt line has a canned response that immediately goes out to that person. If the dog is in foster, the foster home is copied. So they get that information like within 24 hours. This team is amazing. They're so fast. And then it's up to the foster to follow up with that person, schedule the meet and greet, um, et cetera. Um, and then we also have um, on-site matchmakers. They mostly work with, foster, with the dogs uh, at the shelter. But they try to also be aware of who we have in foster and, and vice versa. And so if they've got someone looking for a particular type of dog that we've got in foster, they'll try to refer them to us. I think what's really critical, especially when, like us, you're, you are taking on you know, most of the behavior and, and high medical cases, is to have this support. Um, again, you know, fortunately, we've, we've got a great behavior team, um, and they not only assist the fosters with, beha with behavior-related issues, they also do playgroup assessments for some of our foster dogs if we need to find out how are they with other dogs. Um, and then they also, as I mentioned earlier, will do adoption counseling. And our behavior um, counseling is available after post-adoption. If you adopt from APA, 
you can reach out for our, to our behavior team for the life of that dog. Um, medical, we've got a full clinic. Um, they do the medical intake treatment, do our own spay neuters. Um, most of our necessary surgeries, they're, they're just, they're amazing. So how to grow your foster team. Um, uh, it's again, I just want to emphasize having a designated foster coordinator is just so key. Do that as soon as you possibly can. Um, Make them be for the dog program only, no other organizational responsibilities, and please consider a volunteer. If you don't, if you don't have the staff, like we didn't, put a volunteer in this position. Um, as I said, I think that I'm a good example of rescue experience isn't needed. Uh, sure, it's a bonus, but it's, it's not needed. I think good interpersonal communication, time management, and organizational skills is more important. And in order to develop a team, I really think that volunteer, volunteer or staff management is a plus. I know that that was really invaluable um, to me. Um, so this is the big secret. Um, it, it's, you put the work in up front. And I want to stress, it is a lot of work working with volunteers. You know, there are other um, managers and team also, well, have you recruited a volunteer? For, oh, no, I tried. You know, this person came forward. They ju just didn't work out. That's going to happen. You're going to have to go through, you know, 10 people before you find the one person that maybe is going to be able to do this. Um, but it is worth it in the long run. And frankly, it's the only way we can do this work. There is no way that we will ever be able to have enough staff that we can just hire people to do everything. So um, you've just got to do it. Um, job descriptions are very important. Um, but your positions and teams change over time, so you have to adapt those. You also, um, you need to be flexible. If somebody wants to help um, but doesn't fit one of your job descriptions, make it up. Um, and I, I want to give you an example of how this worked for me. I, literally, I was so desperate for help when I started. So as a, um, when I was doing the work on my own, um, I was working seven, seven days a week. Uh, all the fosters had my phone number. They could call me any time of the day or week. I was work, you know, doing 50 or 60 hours a week. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Um, and I, I just, it was like I was desperate. So anybody who said, and I was constantly recruiting. Anytime I was recruiting for fosters, and do you want to help the team? You know, um, and uh, so I would anybody that could help. We had a foster who, she lived kind of on the very edge. She was 45 minutes from Austin. She was a, um, she had three kids. Uh, she was a full-time mom. She took in bottle babies. And she wanted to help the team but didn't have much time. She said, I can probably give you a couple hours a week. I said, great. This was early on. I said, you know, I want to send an email out to every foster when they get their, their foster dog adopted. I want to thank them. You know, congratulations on the adoption. Thank you. Can you do, oh, yeah. She was great. You know, was excellent writer, good at all of that stuff. And um, so she, she took that on. She came to me, um, it wasn't long after, maybe even a, less than a month, and she said, Ann, you know what, you know, this is great, but they really need help with like the adoption. I said, I know, but I, I just, I don't have anybody to help with that. She said, well, I think that I can. Before you knew it, she was working seven days a week, <laughs> 20 hours a day, on top of everything else. She built up the, the, the dog foster adoption team um, you know, turned it into a team, wrote up policies and procedures. So that person who initially, if I had just said oh, an hour or two, no, I can't use you, I, we, I would have lost all of that. So just, you know, have an open mind. Um, delegate, 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 and give up control. Um, and as I said, create teams, assign leads, turn it over to them, and be flexible. So the top, my top 10 rules for recruiting, retaining volunteers. Um, be thorough, be flexible, be available. And the thing I want to say about this is another one of those things that's a time suck. You know, I would have volunteers calling me in the evening, having to go on for like an hour about what had happened. I tried to time that with a glass of wine so I could sit there, you know, and say, oh, I know, that's terrible, oh my God. Um, but you've got to do that. They're, you know, they're, they have to have opportunities to, to vent. And there's, there's maybe nothing you can even do about it. But um, that's what I mean about being available. And also be available to support them. Just because I had teams out there that I delegated, it didn't mean that I, I gave up. You know, I had to, if they were there, if my volunteers were out there working, I had to be available to them. So they could also continue to call me any time of the day or night or reach out to me if they, if they needed to. I have to. One thing I have to say about that, even though that was the case, almost nobody ever abused that. I had one foster that would call me. <laughs> you know, 
that was different, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had one foster that would call me, like inevitably, like at one or two in the morning, and you know, with this major emergency about this mom and you know, litter of puppies that she. And I was like, going, oh my God, why is it always? And finally, I was talking to someone. And I said, Ann, that's bar time. And sure, I mean, and I always suspected that she sounded like she, you know, maybe had been abusing some or on, the, you know, doing something. And it was just, it clicked. I thought, oh, I think you're right. You know, she just came home and found something, and so she's calling me. But literally, out of the whole time, that was the only, you know, instance where I really had um, anybody, anybody doing that. So um, be humble. Um, you know, I think that we're all happy to get kind of kudos. But if you're like a team leader, give the credit to your team, you know, and, um, and also take the blame. You know, if something's gone wrong with your team, don't, don't blame your team members. Be a cheerleader. Find something to um, praise them about and, and tr instead of focusing on what, what they're not doing. I tend to be a pretty critical person because I kind of have st high standards for myself and everyone else. So I really have to kind of stop myself and say, wait a minute, is this the time to come in and criticize something about the, somebody about this? You know, let's find something positive and then later maybe we can kind of come back and talk about how this, you know, didn't, yeah, how uh, to keep it from happening again. Be a giver, don't hoard knowledge. Um, one thing that I've, I've found, and again, I think that um, is that it can feel really good to be the person with the answers, you know? So when somebody comes to you to just say, hey, um, oh, well, this is what I would do. But it's more important that you give them the information and then ask them, okay, so now what would you do? Because then you're teaching them. And I've always said from the day you start in a position, start training your replacement. Um, so just, you know, share that, share that knowledge. Um, be adaptable. I kind of mentioned already bringing somebody in. Another situation that I had come up is that I did have a volunteer in, that was working as a mentor, and she honestly was kind of driving me crazy. I, personally, I liked her, I, but it was just, it was like I thought, this is just not working out. And I honestly was thinking, is this going to be the time I just have to say, you know what, this volunteer position isn't working out, which you never want to do, just like with a foster. You don't ever want to do that. So I came up with an idea of something else that I thought that she could do. Again, kind of just made it up, although it was something that I thought, well, this could be useful. And she was great with it. You know, moved her over to, she was happier, I was happier. So I just, you know, look for those opportunities. Be a uniter, build relationships, make opportunities to get together. And this is really hard. We're all so busy. Um, you know, we used to try to do it every six months. We'd be lucky if we could do it once a year. And I think it's important if you develop teams, it's important for those teams to get together, but then it's also really important that the, for the whole team to come together because you don't want to create new silos where you know, you're not coming in. You have to remember that you're all part of the foster team and also that you're part of the larger family that you're involved with. Um, be open. Um, I think that this is also really important in our work. This person may not ever be your best friend. They might turn out to be, but they may not be. They might rub you the wrong way, and, but that's okay. You're not there, and I think they mentioned that earlier to, today in the opening. This is not about having people like you or, or creating friendships. It's about saving animals, so you know, get over it, kind of. <laughs> um, okay, so recruitment step strategies. Um, this is something that I've added recently because I've just I've found it. Um, you know, if people will ask me about recruitment, and I go and I look at their website, and I go, "Oh my God, you have to start there." So the number one thing, when you go home or before you leave, go look at your website, or even better, have somebody that's not involved with your organization at all, and ask them, "Go on our website, pretend that you want to be a foster, and tell me what you find there." I can't tell you the number of times I've gone on, the link is broken, or it's impossible to find the information, or there's a phone number and nobody ever answers, and so, which of course they're not going to, we can't answer our phones, if, um, but you don't know if anybody's gonna get, gonna get back to you. So that's the first step. The second thing, um, and this was gonna be in my thing, marketing your organization. Again, when I started, we were so fortunate, we had a kick-ass marketing person who understood this. And from day one, it was all about creating the APA brand and selling that brand and getting it out to the community. Um, you know, when, when Dr. Jefferson first asked me about, you know, doing the, you know, these uh, presentations, 
I, when it came to especially fosters, I said, well, I just don't do that much to recruit. She said, she said, yeah, but what you do is when they come forward, you get them in and then you keep them. But, I, but it was easy for me because people, the word was getting out there about APA. Um, I think what Dr. Jefferson said earlier is, is so true. People want to come um, to, they want to help. They want to be a part of this. And when the Austin community saw that not only was this our mission, um, but that we were actually achieving it because we were getting the word out through the media, they wanted to come in and foster for us. So we were very fortunate with that. Um, secondly, though, the other part of it was reducing those barriers. You know, we made it easy. We were inclusive. We, we brought them in. Again, those, you know, four things. Um, being well organized, I mean, you're never going to be perfect, but you want to try to be as organized as possible. I know when I first went to the volunteer orientation, I was amazed. It was, at, it was at her home. She had binders with the policies printed out and everything, and I just thought, wow, this is, and this is when I thought APA really had its act together, and then I got into the reality, and it was like, oh, okay, well, that was kind of a mirage, but, um, and we almost immediately dropped that because we couldn't afford the binders anymore, but, but it does make an impression on people when they feel like you're, you're well organized, you're ready, you know, um, because for one thing, you're making it easier for them. Um, Let's see, and, and again, be prompt. I just cannot emphasize that enough all the way through the process. Try to get back with people, even if it's just to say, I don't have time to address this right now, but I'm gonna get back with you later. Unless, of course, it's an emergency thing. Um, so expanding your foster base, this is just, the sky's the limit. I think one advantage that we have in animal um, rescue is that there are animal lovers in every walk of life, in every political party, in everything that we do. So literally, you know, it, it's in a way the world's your oyster. They're all out there. So look at, first of all, if your organization does volunteer orientation, make sure you're a part of it. If you do an online orientation, make sure you've got a good foster piece in there. Um, Speak at meetings in the community. If you know anybody, the service organizations generally will meet, you know, at least monthly. If you know somebody who's in the Lions Club or the Optimist Club or something, say, can I come, you know, for just 10 minutes to one of your five minutes to one of your meetings and talk about fostering? Um, I think that's a great way. Posting flyers, both physical flyers. Now, neighborhood listservs are wonderful. This is something that's changed, um, you know, at least for me in the last um, eight or nine years. Uh, you know, you can post their public service annou announcements, uh, you know, make friends, if you've got contacts in the media, print or um, uh, um, air stuff, uh, do that. Social media, again, this is where the marketing um, is, is so important. Um, blogs, Facebook, um, submit a story to local publications. And I think particularly, sometimes I hear people are in small areas and they'll say, oh, you know, you're in Austin, of course you can get all of these. Well, in some ways, when you're in a smaller community, some of these things open up more to you. The local newspapers might be more willing to, um, to, to print a story um, or do a PSA for you. Um, even, you know, some organizations have, have uh, their own newsletters. If you know somebody, say, can I write a blog? Can I, you know, can I write a little story for you to post out to your, to your staff? Um, consider community service. Um, we initially had both um, straight up community service for foster and a teen foster program. Um, since then, the decision was made to, to not do community service any longer, but we do have a teen foster program uh, for community service. Um, that's, I think, really helpful. Um, Recruit at your adoption sites. This is the other benefit of having off-site adoptions. As I said, you know, people see the dogs, if they can't adopt, have your counselor say, well, have you considered fostering? Lemonade out of lemons. I mentioned that earlier about the, the fires that we had and how that brought um, animals in. It's really important that you have an emergency plan before an emergency hits. So if you don't have one right now, go back and make one. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why you might all of a sudden have to take in a group of animals. It can be something like a disaster, like a hurricane, it can be a fire. It can also be that um, you've got a hoarding case. You know, there are 20 cases in your county and that are all gonna come to your organization. You've gotta be prepared to that. One of the things that we did on the foster team is, and again, this was especially when we were still doing phone screenings, 
is that if when there was an emergency, the first thing that we did was reach out to everybody who had ever volunteered on the screening team and say, okay, we know you didn't want to do this anymore, but can you come back on for this week and help us screen? Everybody would, all, you know, almost everybody will come back and give you another week to do that. So just get a, a plan in place. Because um, I'm not suggesting that you go out and start setting, you know, fires, but be prepared to deal with it if it happens. Um, and again, the offsite adoptions. Using social media um, is just is really important. Um, the swappables, uh, we had, you know, a situation where if if it was kind of like, okay, if the if the you know, we talked before about matching. Well, even when you try do your best matching, sometimes it doesn't work out. So it was it kind of like, okay, if this one isn't working out. Do you want to swap them for one of these dogs at the shelter? Okay, all right. There. Um, and this, I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but what it says is take time to celebrate the lives saved, to keep people engaged. Um, this shows the 44 lives saved in 14 days via foster home. So we just had a period of being you know, extremely busy Every single one of these dogs featured here was saved in those two weeks. And that's just such a great visual. One of the great things that the latest dog foster manager has done, again, some, something that was beyond my capabilities, is she has a picture of every single dog that comes into foster. And at the end of the month, she sends out this al album to the whole team. And it's, it's so moving. You know, we don't get to see the animals most of the time because um, we're just we're working on the team behind the scenes. And then to see all those faces, it just really reminds you this is why we're doing it. Retention. Um, I think I mentioned earlier retention um, is, you know, is equally important. Both of the, you will constantly have to recruit and you do everything that you can to retain. Um, and, and just knowing that you're never going to be able to keep all of your fosters. Um, Seeking donations, um, with Austin Pets Alive, we always provided all of the medical care, but we don't provide food, we don't provide treats. Um, we, will, we can usually provide a leash, we can usually provide a crate, that, um, and the dogs do all go home with a collar, but other than that, they're on their own. One of the volunteer positions that I recruited for before we had that shelter was a, 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 a resource person. And that came about because we were getting food donated to us in huge 50-pound bags. I'd have to go pick up the 50-pound bags, which are almost as big as me, put them in my you know, little car, take them home, store them. Then a foster needed them. I had to drive them out, meet them. Well, it wasn't something that came up that often, but when it did, it was a huge time suck for me. So I reached out to one of our fosters who was retired and a much bigger guy than me, and I said, would you mind taking this on? He said, no problem, loved it. So from then on, when we got donated food, I'd just say, okay, you know, go, go pick this up, and he dealt with it. So it was an example of one kind of small thing that took a huge kind of load off of, off of me, it, literally. So training, um, APA has never done, um, well, we tried it once. We tried doing an on-site training class. Again, it's been one of those things we've just never been able to get around to. I think it's great when you can do it. AAC, I think, is a great setup where you don't have to go through the class before you start fostering, but within three months, you do have to go through it. Um, but you do want to try to train your, your fosters um, as much as you can. Uh, one of the things that we've done in the past, and we're really implementing that now as a program, are specialized um, topics. Uh, you can do this during vid uh, via video. It is great when you can do some classroom because it also kind of brings fosters together. It helps they get to meet each other. They also get to meet you. Um, a clear policies and procedures is just kind of like the same thing of being organized. You know, you want your fosters to know what they need to do. Um, mentoring is really important. Um, making sure it's a good match. Trying to honor requests to move fosters in a timely manner. And again, those three words, be supportive, available, and thank them. Um, so keeping your foster community engaged. Uh, touched on some of this, sharing your stories, your successes, um, when it happens. Foster parent social. We, we did more of these. Again, when we were smaller, we were able to do that. We did some meetups and things. Again, it was great. Um, we kind of got away from it simply because what we found was that it was the same kind of core group of fosters that were coming, which was great. We always had a good time, but it was a lot of work on our part, and we just had to kind of divert that to other things. But if you can get that going, that's great. We do have a closed Facebook group, and then we also have an open um, foster adoption page. Uh, that's a, a great thing to do. Um, foster, foster mentoring, we encourage that. Something that 
other um, organizations across the country do more of, we don't do as much because we have actually specific teams that do this, is forming actual foster teams where there'll be a number of volunteers that support kind of these specific foster dogs. So I might be fostering the dog, but then, you know, maybe Kelly is like taking the dog on weekends to, you know, give me a break. And then um, maybe, I, you know, Chris is doing Facebook postings for me or helping me with the marketing and stuff. So that's another good way to support your teams. Um, and then, like I said, having adoption events for foster dogs. Um, this is a video that we won't have time for, Midsummer Night's Dream. It was a really cute thing. We had a fo really creative foster that came up with the idea of doing a scene out of Midsummer Night's Dream, coordinated all of this, um, and you know, had the different foster dogs playing the different roles. It, it's adorable. Um, and if anybody wants it, you know, email me and I'll send you the URL. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of long, so it's not something that we really have been able to use. To, you have to consider those things when you're doing it. But it was a great bonding and fun experience for the fosters. And like I said, it is adorable. Um, policies and procedures, I, I think we've talked about why that's important. Um, they don't need to be comprehensive to start. Like I said, we developed ours as we went along. It's, this is one time where it's absolutely okay. In fact, we encourage stealing. Um, again, we're willing to share any of our um, policies and procedures. You know, um, share. Um, Y'all should be sharing and reaching out to others. When I started, I could not find any information on foster. I even went to human fostering and I couldn't find um, much help. Um, I, I talked about this, avoid placing unnecessary requirements on foster families. Um, and your policies and procedures should always relate to your key priorities and principles, and these are ours. As we were about to go into our second year, Dr. Jefferson asked each team lead to come up with what are your priorities, and I really struggled with this, and I came up with these three, and I thought it was so great. I met with her, and I said, okay, dogs are moved through as quickly as possible. We provide the best possible care that we can within our limitations, and our foster parents are supported, and she looked at said, yeah, that's great. She said, what about saving lives? And I said, well, of course, that's a given. But yeah, so, so of course, that's the, that's the number one. Um, but what, I, what this did, I mean, it's more than just words on the paper. It, what it did is any time I was developing a policy or procedure, I kind of went back to this. And I said, does it support these priorities? And, or is it something that maybe is just making life easier for us? And in some cases, if making it easier for us supports one of those priorities, then, then you're going to do it. But if it's just coming up with a policy, you know, that, that um, you know, anyway, it's just go back and double check it against this. And I think also that this is something that we constantly, you know, we share with our foster teams to keep everybody focused. You know, I'm, I'm not pushing to get this dog adopted because I want to be the blue meanie. Um, it's because this is our, these are our priorities. Uh, we're trying to save those next, uh, those next animals. Um, there's a lot of word, I think this is all pretty self-explanatory. You, you know, you've got to have policies around your application policy, your process, your placement process, ongoing care, medical care, the adoption, and make sure your liability um, is covered. Um, I've, we talked about this kind of already. Um, these are just some different options. What's, what's just really important is that you to pro provide some training, you know, for your, for your fosters, however you can do it. Um, like I said, I think classroom training is really, you know, that would be if we could all do that, you know, all the time and keep saving the numbers we're saving, that would be great. Um, but it isn't always possible. So, you know, look at some of these others. Um, I talked about this. We don't have classroom uh, orientation. Um, we, we've got a handbook that we developed. Some, um, we, we have a set of standardized emails. And the way we did this to not overwhelm our fosters is that we send them out at different stages. So when you're approved, you get one set of general information. Then when you first take a dog, you get information specific kind of to that part of the process. When you, um, and then the mentoring team will send you information on the medical, you know, when you need to um, have your dog vaccinated, get, have spay neuter surgery, and then when they're ready for adoption, the adoption team sends out information about that. Um, it's not, it's far from perfect, but it's, it's gotten us by. Um, and then just general email correspondence and assistance for our mentors, and then I mentioned the specialized classes or lectures. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I, I hope you were all there this morning in the, in the opening. I think that um, Ellen and um, Brent and Ryan, they really hit home about data. 
Um, again, one of the other things that, that uh, she had us do early on was to come up with our own um, set of performance measures, and um, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But I was glad to hear them say this. Data really does keep you honest. I've heard people throw out so many things about, you know, oh, well, the number of fosters goes up in the summer or the number of fosters goes down in the summer. It's like, well, really, have you looked at your data? Um, because I, I can assure you that oftentimes when you look at that data, it will not necessarily support what you think has happened. We're, we're so touched by the emotion of the moment, kind of what we're feeling. So um, this is just, again, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, these are some of the things, you know, it's basically the numbers. They talked about the importance of data when you're determining your target population, who you're gonna start with, that's really important. But it's then also important throughout the time of your program to see are you continuing to be effective. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is staff and volunteer numbers and hours, Chris Guthrie, um, is that, you know, I mean, some of our biggest, not to call Chris out, but um, our biggest volunteers were putting in the most time weren't recording their hours. And so it didn't show the amount of time that was going into our, the foster program. And that information is critical for grants, and not only for grants, but um, I mentioned the previous session about because we seem like the hidden program, we have to become advocates for our program. When I could go to Dr. Jefferson with actual numbers and say, we have got to have a staff manager because these are the numbers of animals. These are the numbers of volunteer hours that we're putting through. These, this is the dollar amount that we are bringing in and it more than justifies having a staff position. That you're gonna be much more effective at that. And what's really important, the tracking is that it's your responsibility to ensure the safety of the animals in your care. And I tell you what, nothing will lose the credibility of the com your, your credibility in the community faster than if you don't kind of honor that. Um, we use, um, like I said, right now, now we're using Shelter Love, but we also maintain a tracking spreadsheet that I'm gonna show you. We have performance measures, we use end of day reports, um, uh, our web-based system, and then also just we periodically will create a spreadsheet, you know, to monitor, you know, a specific need. Um, so, uh, again, with foster program, are your dogs hiding in plain sight? Again, uh, this is my little Fletcher. He was my fa foster fail win um, because who could, you know, ignore that face, even though I was not a little, a little dog person. Um, so this is our tracking spreadsheet. And I apologize, I'm not sure how well you can see this. Again, happy to share this. But this was developed early on when we were developing the teams. There were two things that we needed to make this be successful. Um, the first was um, group emails. Initially, when a volunteer came, came on, like to um, a volunteer mentor or on the adoption team, they used their own personal email address. Well, when that person left, you had to kind of, you had to train the whole, you know, all the fosters again, okay, use this new email. The other thing is if that person was sick for the day, there was no way to step in and respond to emails. So we set up emails for each one of those um, teams. So dog-foster coordinator at austinpetsalive.org. So that gave the ability to share that responsibility over a number of volunteers, as well as gave you the ability that if somebody was sick, you, anybody could, you know, the, the manager could step in and answer those emails. Um, the other thing that allowed this was this spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheet is shared with a bunch of people, Buku people all across the organization. A limited number of people have access to edit it. Um, and uh, this, so when I was doing this, again, I had a volunteer, this was the early day, and I was explaining to her what I needed. I said, we really need to have something that is just a snapshot of who is in foster. She came up with this. I thought it was, you know, God's gift to the rescue world. Uh, little did I know, it was a simple Google spreadsheet, which now I can do all day, you know, in and out. But, but at the time, it was, and I will say, what she developed is, we've made minor adjustments, but it's been pretty much the same. We're still using it today. And even though, um, in our experience, Shelter Love is, we think is really gonna be able to give us a lot more, be more user friendly and give us a lot more data and stuff, this still has worked really well for us. And it's, um, you know, this is one of those things that they're gonna pry this out of my cold, dead hands because it's, it's been so useful. What it does is it allows you, your whole team can kind of see the status of, of these animals. Um, and you don't have to give all of those people access to your database because that's, that's a you know, scary, like when you're working with a team of 35, 40 volunteers, you don't wanna give them all access to, to that. 
Um, the color across the, the top is significant. So for example, the placement team, does, they're the ones that make um, updates and all of this. Um, you know, you've got your foster's name, I mean, the, the, the name of the dog, um, you know, breed, whether or not they've been spay neutered, male, form, uh, female, um, who their foster is, the foster contact information. And then if you move over, then the, the fuchsia part is our mentor team. That shows, um, you know, have they had surgery? If not, when is it scheduled? Um, you know, any particular notes, like they'll put vaccine information. Um, then under adoption, have they been posted to the web? Are they available? Um, like in the top case, no, because they're, they're too young, but they'll be made um, available November 24th. Obviously, this is not a current copy. And also, um, everybody can see, oh, this dog has a pending adoption. So this has been just incredibly helpful. Um, I'm not gonna spend, this is more something that we do internally. If you're a big organization, they can be helpful. You know, we can cut, we see the adoption um, notes for the day, so it's kind of a, a, a second check that we can see, oh, that foster dog was adopted at that site today. And also medical notes, behavior notes, etc. So performance, um, again, I'm not gonna uh, spend much time on this. I think it was just covered beautifully today, earlier today, it's, it's so critical. And these are our um, performance measures. So um, this is something else that what I initially came up wa with were um, the, the top three, the number of approved dog fosters, the number of active fosters, and the difference between those is that we brought pe fosters on and approved them very quickly, and, and you know, we've got incredible numbers, you know, now well over 2,000. Obviously, not all of those people are actively fostering. So the active foster number, that represents the number of fosters that had a foster dog for at least one day during that month. Um, so that's kind of more representative of, of how many people are really actually available. Um, and then the number of dogs in foster. What we added later was the number of dogs um, adopted by foster, and we, we break, break that down a little bit further. Um, you don't necessarily need to know that. We look at like who got adopted at site, um, who got uh, adopted um, from an event, um, and then the total numbers. And as I said, we've actually, since this screenshot was done, we've added in you know, how much was the adoption fee for them. Um, the, and then we also, the other one that we've added is the number of dogs um, that died during the, the uh, month. Fortunately, that number is very small. We do have some because we do take in some of the most um, frail animals. You know, a, a one-day-old puppy, even with the best care, um, doesn't always stand a good chance of surviving. Um, and then we also, we, we have hospice. We take hospice animals into foster and um, that, uh, so. Um, I think that just an example of where this was useful, when, when we first started and we had the off-site adoptions, the goal in the foster program was get, the, get this foster dog to the shelter where they can be adopted. So like at eight weeks, when the puppy was spayed, neutered, they went, back, they went to the shelter to get adopted there. Well, what we found was that you know, that was good for turning over numbers in the foster program. We had to do that initially to make space. But then what we realized is that, one, that wasn't working very well for the fosters. You know, if you had, you know, they talked earlier about the person who had the bottle babies that then had to turn them over to the shelter that would, you know, um, yeah, that's not good. Um, and, but equally bad, even if they survive, is just have, giving up. You know, here I've gotten this puppy to eight weeks and now I've got to turn them into the shelter and they're going to get them adopted out. Um, and the other thing is that, so our foster animals were going to these off-site adoptions or going into the shelter. Well, they were taking up room where we could have been saving other animals. So we completely shifted our focus, and instead of getting them to that point, it became we're to try to get as many of our dogs adopted directly out of the foster program as possible. And having our performance measures allowed us to monitor all of that. <clears throat> so kind of to, <clears throat> to recap, and for those of you that were here before, this is a repeat. Um, we went from a single volunteer to the largest foster program in the country in a matter of a few years. Um, and that, um, you know, this was possible through the use of volunteer teams. And all of that applies to any of your teams. That's not unique to foster. Any, if you're, you know, trying to develop other programs, all of that stuff applies. Um, again, remember all of this was done through the use of volunteers, most of whom had no prior experience. Um, this is all pretty much a repeat. I'm going to just let you look at that because I think um, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, 
And some of this uh, is um, shamelessly stolen from Ryan Clinton previously, and then I added a few things. Um, but I think it's really important. Your situation is not unique. You know, so many people say, oh, I know you can do this, but you know, this is our situation. And just as an example, the size of our program, people will say, oh, well, you're in a big urban area, or you've got all these programs. We didn't have that. When we started out, we didn't have the staff. We didn't have a clinic. We didn't have a behavior team. Um, but so your situation is not unique. The wheel has been invented. I already said that, steal ideas. Look outside animal rescue for other ideas. I think marketing is probably the, the big one where we really you know, kind of looked outside and said, hey, hey this is for us. Um, start like yesterday. Don't expect to wait for someone else to do it. No kill begins with you. Um, and, and even beyond no kill, um, you know, again, even for the, the individual rescue groups, um, it's, you know, if you say this one, there's gonna be another one there. So um, fear is your biggest enemy and perfection is the enemy of life saving. Um, so again, this is where just, you know, just start doing it. Um, we already talked about that every day. Um, the other thing is don't accept the status quo. In hindsight, one of the things that actually was a benefit for me about not having experience is that I didn't have any preconceived ideas about how rescue should be done. So when I was suggesting um, you know, some of these changes, I wasn't fighting in my head against what I, you know, what I thought was. It was just kind of like, well, why can't we do this? So be, um, you know, particularly if you've been doing this for a long time, really think about you know, some of these things. And is it really? A, is it working towards saving lives? You know, are you saving more lives because of doing things that way? Um, have a goal, but once you've achieved it, set a new goal. Like I said, our goal was making Austin no kill. We did that. Then we re started reaching out to the community. So going back to Trapper, I just have to I just have to share this with you, and I apologize that I'm going to read because it's been a while. So as I said, I, I fostered him in um, September October of '09. It was actually further back than I thought. Um, and like I said, I was thinking about adopting this adolescent guy with ears that I swear we're tuned into Mars. Um, but I, I literally, I was talking with the adoption counselor and I was trying to make up my mind and she said, Ann, I'm gonna be on site. Why don't you have him come out to site this weekend? See if he gets adopted. You know, and if he doesn't, then you know, kind of think about it. Well, of course, Saturday I got this call from her and she said, Ann, the perfect family has just, and I hesitate to use this because I don't want you to ever think there is a perfect family. So I really shouldn't even say that. A great family came for him. And, um, and I, I said, okay, I didn't even get to say goodbye to him. You know, it was like, okay, he's, he's going home, but that's good. Um, oddly enough, they renamed him Max, which was my first foster dog. So I thought that was pretty weird. So the next day I get up, six o'clock, I'm at my computer, you know, checking the foster stuff, and I get this email. And my new adopted mom woke up thinking about you this morning, hoping that you're not missing me too much and are happy knowing that I'm going to be part of a young family in central Austin. I'm not 100% sure what to make of this new group, but they have two young kids who are going out of their way to shower me with love and affection. The mom and dad are nice too, and, I sure, and they sure like having me around. This morning I'm going to get to walk with a boy and girl to school, which should be fun. I'm still sleeping this morning, but my boy just woke up and told his mom, I think we got the best dog ever. I can never get through this without. Um, so then about a week later, I got this. I, needless to say, I was like sitting at my computer sobbing when I read that. So about a week later, I get this. The kids have taken to reading to him every night. Last night, I overheard them hugging him and telling him that he's one of the most important people in their lives. Then a week or two after that, I get that. As you can tell, we love him. Several times a week, we all sit around talking about how he really is the best dog in the world. This is the dog that the city shelter was gonna kill. Thanks for all that you did to protect him. I overheard Luke telling his friends the other day, Max's foster mom saved his life so that he could wait and join our family. And if that does not epitomize what fostering is all about, I don't know what does. Without fostering, dogs are leaving shelters in body bags instead of going to adoptive homes. And I even used this when I um, talked to our city council because I said, there are two sides to rescue. One side is the animals that we're saving. The other side is the benefit to the people in this community. This dog has added immeasurably to this family. And like I said, when I got that picture of him and she said, yes, he has gone to the soccer games. He has gone camping with us. And he is now a senior enjoying this. It's just, that's what this is all about. So um, anyway, so that's it. Thank you for that indulgence, and I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. 
Hi, um, I'm Kelly Dewar. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I am the foster care specialist for Maddie's Fund. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about, um, just very briefly, I'm going to try and make this like 10 minutes or less so we have some time for questions. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some cool things that we are learning about foster care and also some uh, ways that we are working together to provide resources for foster care programs and foster coordinators. One of the things we've been, that I've been doing in this position is we are doing some foster studies. And um, we're one of the one we're doing this year, from 2017 to 2018, we have seven shelters uh, across the United States. And, um, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> seven shelters across the United States. Uh, I went to every one of them um, and worked on training them how to do the protocol and stuff. We also call it the um, cross-country uh, foster dogs in my hotel room <laughs> tour. <laughs> um, that's Haim. He liked to party at 6 a.m. <laughs> uh, so each shelter is putting 30 dogs, uh, doing, having 30 dogs who are in the shelter, and they're doing behavior uh, surveys like at about three weeks and then about a week later. And then there's the dogs on the foster track. So each shelter also does 30, puts 30 dogs in foster. They do a shelter survey, and then the, the first day in foster they do a survey, and the, um, the seventh day they do a survey. We're measuring behavior and length of stay from uh, the shelter to foster care. And we've got some amazing preliminary results, which will not surprise anyone, but just to have the data is so awesome. Literally, on every single aspect of the things that we have um, been measuring, their behavior has improved. From the shelter, the blue line is the shelter um, about three to five weeks in the shelter. Uh, the orange line is 24 hours in foster, and the seven days in foster is the gray line. And then on the things that the negative kind of behaviors, all of them went down after seven days in foster. Uh, we are getting a little bit of extra data. Um, Louisville Metro Animal Services, uh, they came to our apprenticeship uh, in March, literally the day that the foster coordinator came back to her community. Oh, <laughs> literally the day that she went back to her community, she started a day trip foster program. And it is one of the most successful day trip foster programs that I know of, um, but really, what we're finding is that day trip foster is kind of like the gateway to longer term foster. It really gets a lot of people involved who can't necessarily or don't think that they are able to do long term foster. Um, and a lot of them become longer term fosters, but a lot of animals um, are find adopters and um, advocates through this as well. So in the first four months of her program, she doubled, basically doubled their number of fosters. They had nearly 200 field trips taken, so these dogs are getting out of the shelter for hours or all day. And then 40 extra adoptions that are directly related to those outings. People who adopted their foster, or their parents adopted their foster, or they met somebody out there who met the dog and decided to come back to the shelter and adopt. So we, I, we are um, hypothesizing that these programs are super important. Uh, this is a new study that will be starting in a couple of months, and it is a, basically an expansion on the foster studies we've done in the past. We are looking at differences in training methods for foster coordinators and shelters. We are doing the apprenticeships, so some of the shelters will go through the apprenticeships. Some of them will have me come out and do the training on site. And then we're developing online training, which um, will all be kind of connected. It'll be the same types of things that they will go through instead. And we'll see which ones um, seem to be the most helpful. But we're also going to look at, at three different types of foster programs. The day outing foster program, weekend and overnight foster, foster programs, and long-term long foster care. So... Uh, one of the things that I've been working on in, in the last year is um, the medium and large adult dog foster apprenticeships. If you haven't been to one, please apply. I've been working on study-related training be because we'll be going out there um, and training. And then also Maddie's University, which is a new, the new online training. Uh, another thing that um, we have started since I began um, is consulting. 
One of my positions is to be available to shelters and rescues who are looking to expand or create foster programs. So this year I've gone to several different shelters and sometimes I'll do it over the phone and sometimes I'll do it via conference calls and sometimes uh, site visits. So we'll go out there and help them either, you know, you know, talk about what they need and build their foster programs or help expand it. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with best friends uh, in, in September, October with their hur hur Hurricane Harvey dogs. Um, we started a foster program basically from scratch. It was like MASH style and it was just, it was an incredible experience. <laughs> And then Chicago does not have a foster program currently, but we went out there and have started to develop it. They should be rolling it out soon. Another thing that it has been one of the responsibilities that will be available to you guys is um, a lot of resources that we're compiling and gathering and creating resources for foster care. So um, one cool, cool thing that's coming up, Maddie's Pet Forum is uh, kind of an internal uh, resource group so there's different groups on the inside and it you know there's there's a foster care group there's an adult dog foster group there are do there are groups related to pretty much anything and you can create your own groups but it's all people in animal welfare exchanging information and it's it's really uh so far really amazing uh we are also building task lists and templates for growing and expanding foster programs i've been collecting it from a lot of different places so that we have all kinds of, of stuff that you can look at and you know, kind of create your own information. And um, the, uh, the marketing guide for foster caregivers, which will, is in the editing stages. And um, that's about it.